traditional view okay, concerning animals. If you are concerned about animals, which most people are to a certain extent, they take the position we call animal welfare. And he uh, takes this position pretty clearly when he says, they who delight in the suffering and destruction of inferior creatures will not be apt to be very compassionate or kind to those of their own kind. Okay? So there's a value there in treating animals well because the person who treats animals well or has some respect for their suffering will be more likely to have respect for human suffering. And he goes on to say, children should be taught not to spoil or destroy anything unless it be for the preservation or advantage of something that is nobler and indeed I think people should be accustomed from their cradles to be tender to all sensible creatures and to spoil or waste nothing at all. Okay? So that's pretty clear. That's pretty, uh, I guess, if you heard that coming out of somebody's mouth today, you'd probably say they're a moderate on this issue, right? You know? Almost everybody can agree that we shouldn't despoil and waste the environment, that we shouldn't be intentionally cruel to animals, um, and that there's a value in being sensitive uh, to their feelings, right? To, but not to go so far as to become a vegetarian out of principle. Um, obviously, Locke um, is not going there, okay? So we can ask, what kind of uses would somebody like Locke allow? For animals, what kind of uses do you think somebody like Locke, who's a sort of a moderate or an animal animal welfare, would he allow? Okay, yeah, I think so. Fur would be allowed because that's a, a use that can be put that benefits human beings. Mm -hmm. Glue. What glue? Okay, glue and other products. Okay, such as glue. From horses' hooves, right? Okay. Well, food, obviously, right? What about um, experimentation? Would anybody, would anybody think he wouldn't approve of that? He could experiment on a animal and then use that knowledge to perfect a surgery or some such thing as that. That would be a legitimate use. Right? Okay, I think so. Okay, as long as it didn't involve excessive cruelty, right? And work, which is something that we don't see much anymore, but animals in the past did a lot of work for us. So, you know, he wasn't railing about horses carrying people from place to place or dogs, um, you know, herding sheep. Okay, so there's a lot of uses that a person could put. Now he might, you know, I mean, you could say perhaps somebody like Locke might wonder whether some Something like this is something we absolutely have to have, maybe, but I just doubt whether he would really have too much trouble with that. But what he wouldn't allow is, uh, according to what he says here, is just you know hunting for sport, for instance. That hunting for sport is different in, in the view of somebody like this than hunting for food. If you're just going around shooting pigeons or ducks and then not eating them or not you know, giving them to somebody else, that's a wasteful use. Okay? Or any other thing that involves unnecessary suffering. So he's against cruelty to animals. He would be against treating horses, dogs, and other animals a burden, uh, cruelty and cruelly in order to train them and so forth. Okay? So this is a fairly, I would say, mainstream position that's still held by a lot of people today. Okay? Notice that it doesn't have anything to do with rights. He's not, he's not saying animals have rights. He doesn't even bring that up. That's not even an issue for him. But he's asking what, you know, what benefit or drawback do they have for human <coughs> beings? And if we're cruel to them or waste them, that's not beneficial to human beings as well as it's not beneficial to them. It creates in human beings a, a hardness of, of you know, getting used to cruelty and used to wastefulness that's not desirable. Okay, and the second quote that I brought in is from Jeremy Bentham. And he's a little different and, and uh, a little bit more like Peter Singer um, on the issue of animals. First of all, um, he talks about in what ways animals are different from human beings. 
Okay? And usually we use these arguments to say that human beings are of a different type than animals and that therefore we have rights and we have privileges that animals don't have. Things that make us different from from animals include our ability to speak, our advanced reasoning capabilities, and our dexterity. And most animals don't have nearly the manual dexterity that we have. <coughs> but Bentham asks the question, aren't there similarities that are more important than the differences when it comes to how we should treat them? Okay. And remember, this is a guy writing in the, uh, in the 19th century. Okay. And he says, Surely a full-grown horse or dog is beyond comparison a more rational as well as a more conversable animal than an infant of a day or a week or even a month old. But suppose they were otherwise. What would it avail? The question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? So for him... He makes this point that you can, you can see that there are animals that are more intelligent than very small children. Okay? I, you could even go farther than that, and there are animals that are more intelligent in some ways than a small toddler. Okay? But the toddler has a capacity for advancement far beyond that, and that's something we'll have to talk about. All right? But for Bentham, the question is not really about that, but about can they suffer, can they feel? That's the criteria by which you should judge how you treat a being. And, of course, the answer is yes. Okay? So Bentham's standard for treating animals humanely is what we call sentience. And this is a word that Singer uses. Sentience means the ability to feel pain and suffer or the ability to feel pleasure. To be able to be aware of your feelings of pain and pleasure. Okay? It's that awareness that's important. So, Peter Singer falls more in line with Bentham and with utilitarianism. And in fact, from looking at some of the things that he's written, I'm fairly comfortable saying that he is a utilitarian. Okay? There's reasons for that, which I'll get into a little bit here. But he's asking the question, you know, how can we enhance the life experience of all creatures that have sentience? And why is it do we exclude animals from consideration, okay, if we share this very important aspect of sentience with them? Okay, well, has anybody heard of, heard of Singer before? Okay, three people, right? Anybody over here? Four people? Five? Okay, pretty good, pretty good. He's a pretty controversial figure, and that's probably why some of you have heard of him. Um, he, he's from Australia. He's a native-born Australian. He came to the United States. Um, the, the position that he had before Princeton was at the uh, University of New York as a professor of philosophy with a job as a bioethicist. Okay? And in 1999, Princeton hired him as uh, the, the full title is DeCamp Professor in the University Center for Human Values. So as a special center, um, I'm sure he's also affiliated with the philosophy department, but he, he uh, was hired to write and teach on bioethics. Okay? Now, when this happened, when, when they decided they announced the appointment, which was a fairly very prestigious appointment and would pay quite a bit for a professor anyway. Um, there was a lot of controversy about this. Um, alumni started writing the university and protesting, well, how can you hire Peter Singer because he advocates things that are immoral. And, uh, and um, various student groups on campus were protesting, the, um, like student handicapped students and uh, pro-life students, and um, uh, there was a special group that cre- was created called Students Against Infanticide. Um, it was spurred just by Peter Singer. Um, so, you know, Princeton decided to hire him anyway, and they did uh, issue a statement as to why. Okay? And their statement was, we're not necessarily agreeing with what he writes, but he's a very brilliant person who's made his mark in philosophy, and, you know, he has a a right to be heard and uh, you know sort of a free marketplace of ideas response okay 
Um, so he's still there, and he's most famous for his arguments on animal rights. And I'll just pass it. I, I before I realized how many pages it was, I printed out this Vita, and then I thought, no, I'll probably wasted a tree or two, and that other guy would really be mad at me for, <laughs> for doing that. But um, but anyway, if you flip through there, you'll see that he has written an enormous amount. I mean, <coughs> lots of books. And many of them have been translated into multiple languages and gone through multiple editions. He's, he's an author whose um, popularity extends beyond academia by quite a bit and, and you know he's he's been in uh, popular press interviews and he's got his own fan club not not officially but I mean there's definitely a fan club of pe people who like Peter Singer um, so he wrote this book in 75 and that was sort of a culmination of, of thoughts on animal liberation and then he appears to have extended his thoughts on animal liberation and his argument about uh, their rights due to sentience to more thoughts about, about human beings and the status of human beings and human rights. And the, basically the way I see him is that he has, he's sort of a pure intellectual and he's basically taken his ideas as far as he possibly can in every direction uh, in order to see where they go without regard necessarily for the, you know, the impact of them. He's simply thinking his arguments through to see where they go. He's infamous, uh, if you want to put it that way, the people who protest against him, um, for questioning of our treatment of certain classes of human beings. Okay? He questions why we treat certain classes of human beings with the same full respect and rights that we accord um, adult, uh, you know, completely uh, normal human beings. Infants, for instance. Um, this book here raises the question um, of whether it would be acceptable to euthanize certain disabled infants up to 28 days after birth. Okay? And his reasoning is that they are not sentient. Okay? And of course that um, raised the uh, fears and ire of handicapped rights groups um, who thought that Singer would have advocated their demise uh, born with handicaps, mental handicaps, physical handicaps, um, and they were very insulted by the suggestion. Now he's not necessarily suggesting a policy that would touch upon people who are handicapped but still able to um, think and, and um, function in the world. Okay? When he defends himself, he says, I'm talking about people who are not aware and who will never really be aware. Okay? Um, also, extending that argument, he asks why severely retarded people have the same uh, are accorded the same rights um, if they are completely unaware of where they're at in their surroundings. And also elderly people with dementia. And um, he faced that issue himself. I can't remember how he resolved it, but his mother, I believe it was his mother who developed Alzheimer's and um, he had to decide whether to you know, support her maintenance or not. And I think he decided to do so, but I... I I read a story about that a couple of years ago, and I'm fuzzy on it, but I know he did confront it. He did? Yeah. Okay, you remember. Good, thank you. When it came right down to it then, he didn't quite personally want to, to, to uh, add it, follow through, I guess. Um, now, there's another side to Singer, and that is that he tries to be very consistent. And so, since he's concerned with suffering, um, he has personally given one-fifth of his of his annual income to uh, poverty um, remediation overseas. Okay, so he and he actually has written articles saying that he and other people ought to give more than that. That the solution to poverty is a pretty would be a pretty massive wealth transfer from rich countries to poor countries, and that if we were really serious about it, we would we would do that. So he does that himself. So he definitely tries to be consistent. And in his mind, he is not a cruel person. He's not the person that, um, that groups against him uh, claim him to be. Okay? But he is actually, in his mind, trying to enhance the quality of life for a lot of people. Okay, well, you have that um, article, which is 
out of, I think it's out of this animal liberation book, it's all animals are equal, and it sort of it draws a central argument of this out. Um, and he points out, first of all, that, uh, you know, people who have written on women's liberation, like Mary Wollstonecraft back in the 18th century, I think, um, you know, at first when their ideas were published, people responded to them as though they were absurd. Okay? Many, many people responded to uh, early feminist arguments as though they were ridiculous and no one would ever know it, nobody serious would ever listen to them or think that men and women were very equal at all. And so he suggests that the same holds true for animals as well, that you know, his writings today appear to be ludicrous to people, but perhaps as society evolves and changes, they won't seem very ludicrous uh, as time goes by. Now, um, just to kind of ask a question to get us started, okay? Could we extend to uh, to animals the types of rights that we extended to women or to African Americans or other human groups in our society? Can we do that? What do you mean by rights? Well, I mean the kind of rights that we have. I mean, yeah, exactly. You're asking a good question because you can't you can't extend the right to vote to animals, can you? Free speech. Free speech doesn't work either since they can't talk. Yes. That's what I was going to say that I can't speak for animals are they? No, no, and that's, you know, there's a sort of misconception that people have when they first hear this term animal rights, and that's why I wanted to ask that question, because they get this idea of animals walking into the voting booth, or, you know, somehow we're going to enable animals their right to speech and and so forth, but we're not, yeah, <laughs> to bear our we don't that, that's scary. Yes. We have, in a sense, all of us. Mm -hmm. If the manslaughter is accidental, because you're responsible accidentally anyway for killing a human being, and you get maybe even nothing, uh, no penalty for that, um, but if you intentionally harm an animal, you could be put in jail for that or heavily fined for that. Yeah, and that's where uh, that's where the animal right comes in, isn't it? When they're, they're right to life, or they're right not to be misused. Okay, so even Singer is not suggesting that we give them all the rights of human beings, or that they're the same as human beings, or equal to human beings in every respect. Um, and he addresses that concern fairly quickly um, on page 404 at the top. He says. There are important differences between humans and other animals, and these differences must give rise to some differences in the rights that each have. Recognizing this obvious fact, however, is no barrier to the case for extending the basic principle of equality to non-human animals. Okay? There, are, there are ways in which we can be equal. Okay? Um, the fundamental equality, as I've already said, between humans and animals is sentience. We're, we're equal in our capacity to suffer, in his view. Now, that you could argue against that, and you could say that humans are, you have a unique capacity to suffer because they're much more aware and much more conscious than animals do. Animal suffering lasts as long as they're actually experiencing it, whereas humans anticipate it, remember it. Um, and part of human suffering is mental and emotional, which is dissimilar from... Uh, in some ways, from animals, but um, but you know, he I guess he's reasoning on a more basic level here. If they can feel pain and we can feel pain, then we're equal in that in that respect anyway. And so we cannot extend all rights, but we can talk about some rights, and we can talk about different rights for different types of creatures. Okay. Okay, now, to sort of back off a little bit and ask another question that will get us at, at his thinking, um, why do people rebel against the idea of euthanizing severely retarded people? When they do. Why does that seem repugnant to so many people? They might just see it as like a dangerous precedent that, you know, it could go anywhere from there. Okay, there's that. And I've certainly seen that argument being made that if you um, can euthanize a severely retarded person or an elderly person with advanced Alzheimer's, 
that gives the power to a group of people, doctors or the state or whoever is involved in the family members, to take advantage of that and then to use it against people who are not in that situation. Okay, so that's certainly a concern. Yeah. I think some of this empathy because people can think, well, what if it was my family member? What if it was me in this situation? How would mm -hmm. that make me feel? Mm-hmm. Empathy. Yeah. Would you wish to be treated in this way? Some people actually say yes. Many people say no. Uh, or understand that the family has an emotional tie to even a severely retarded or disabled person. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a long question, but um, the family members are just like, what if it was me? And then you'd have to define what that was, and somebody would have to define it. So. Um, I think you have to worry too about getting into a situation of euthanasia, convenience. Mm hmm. Okay. But once you establish that as a practice, that in fact people can, you know, we've had some controversy over assisted suicide and um, for the same sort of reasons. Mm -hmm. Be religious arguments against plain God. Mm hmm. Right, religious arguments. Um, I was just reading Genesis again with uh, with my son and um, realized that in there, like in the first few uh, chapters, there's this statement by God to the effect that human beings are different from all other animals and created in God's image. And if that's the case, and you know, also there's the, the statement that basically I give you life, You're, it's not yours to take. Right. Then, you know, it's, it's of a different type. It's a, you know, more precious according to that tradition anyway so certainly religious arguments can, can support another thing is you know people live 80 or 100 years you never know what's going to happen uh -huh. down the road that you know would potentially improve their quality of life mm -hmm. advancements in science yes right there's a lot of uh, work being done right now on regenerating uh, you know Alzheimer's patients' brain tissue and, and uh, healing things that previously we never thought we could possibly do. Yeah. And this is going to sound a little weird, but um, sometimes with people with um, mental retardation and stuff, they kind of have their own growth. Mm -hmm. But if you surround them with a lot of people who say you can't do that and never let them try, <coughs> you know, they reach their own potential. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of danger of that happening too. Mm -hmm. and that's well, yeah, I, that's a very good point. Possibly if you sanction this type of killing, basically what you're saying is this life is not worth living. And if people are surrounded by that message that certain types of lives are not worth living, you would think there'd be a lot less fostering of the type of growth that they could potentially experience. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of people wouldn't see it. It's much more different than Hitler or any, in any such you know, euthanized movement where you just... Say this life isn't worth as much as this next one. You're not human enough, I mm -hmm. guess, and so kill them. Yeah, you know, that's uh, that was an argument that was raised by handicapped rights groups. That, in fact, that that connection was made between uh, the euthanization ideas of uh, Adolf Hitler and Peter Singer. And of course, he again he would deeply resent the connection, and yet uh, at a philosophical level the connection can be made you know that you can make the argument that um, <coughs> what that represents is to say that uh, we only want to breed healthy life and anything that we consider defective we want to do away with you know and to perfect the human race in effect you know you could you could certainly see it as that kind of project okay well there are therefore quite a few reasons why people rebel there seems to be a notion that there's <coughs> a um, sort of intrinsic human dignity, you know, that is somewhat reflected, well, it is reflected in the religious arguments, but more generally reflected just in the way that we deal with people, you know, the extent to which we go oftentimes to enhance the quality of life of people who are very disabled. Um, but now this is going to be a hard question. Okay? If we... Um, have these reasons for protecting um, the 
severely mentally retarded um, and people with dementia, then why don't we protect the life of the unborn fetus? Okay. All the way up to birth. Okay. A seven-month-old fetus in the womb, one could say, has no more or less sentience than the handicapped infant once outside of the womb. <coughs> because at that point, it's not like their own person is still part of the womb. Right. 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 Right another human being, which, well, then the, the comeback argument is, yes, and so are severely handicapped people. They're not actually a part of somebody else's body. However, they're completely and utterly dependent upon other people for their survival. Yeah. And so it's the, you want to establish that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Singer makes the point, too, that we, we somehow miraculously transform an infant from somebody who has no rights when they're in the womb, even if they're even if they're viable, very viable, to somebody who has all the rights of a human being right after birth. Okay? And yet the infant right after birth is no different really than before. They are not very sentient at all. They're completely unknowing. They're completely dependent. Now you could argue that they're not necessarily dependent upon their mother because if their mother wishes to you know, break off that dependency, they can still be t taken care of by somebody else. Okay? But certainly they're no more aware a few days after birth than they were before. Right? But we make this big distinction. Okay? Now, I raise that because Singer does and also because Singer uses that to point out the sort of irrationalities in the way that we deal with life. Okay. He uses the fact that we have these sort of illogicalities in the way that we view human life. Okay. That we can destroy a, you know, almost to term baby. Okay. And that baby has no rights, but yet, right after birth, if we kill it, it's murder. Okay. Or, um, you know, if, if the baby, and you know, now we have a lot, the baby is killed inside the mother's womb by somebody else. It can be murder, okay, the Lacey Peterson situation. So he points these things out to show that our society has inconsistencies and illogic on these, on these issues about life and who has rights and who doesn't. And he starts his argument with that, okay. He's, he's not saying necessarily that infants have rights. This isn't a pro-life argument, but he's saying that, that, um, that we don't really no, you know, we haven't really been able to fully figure this out. We have a prejudice for preserving life once it's outside the womb. But is it anything more than a prejudice? Okay? Somehow. I mean, is there any other basis for it? Okay. So, let's get to the central ideas of Singer's argument. Okay. First, then, he argues... The first step is that he says, all human, not all human beings are equal. Okay, we say they are um, in a legal sense, but really they aren't. Not all human beings are equal. There is a wide variation in intelligence, and um, we have those cases that we've just talked about mental retardation, very young infants, elderly people uh, with dementia. These people are very, very different from the normal human being. So different that in his view, we ought to be able to treat them differently. Okay? But we say that they all have human rights. Okay? The second step, he says, both types Human and non-human can experience sentience. Not every non-human creature is sentient. 
single cell organisms are not sentient. Right? Worms, I don't know. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But, but, be, but at a fairly little level, you can see that creatures are aware of their surroundings and that they can and do feel pain and pleasure. Okay? Probably all of you have wondered at some point just exactly how much can my pet feel, for instance. Does the pet have emotions? Okay. Does your dog or cat have emotions? Okay. What do you think? My friend's sister has her dog on Prozac. Oh, the <laughs> depressed dog. That's actually fairly common. Really? I didn't know that. So that would certainly imply a belief that they do. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of people who believe that their pets have fairly deep feelings, and they do all kinds of things to help them. There's a trend towards people bequeathing their in their will uh, their home to their pet. There are people in New York City who have bought their apartment and given enough money so that their pet can live in there until it dies because it would have anxiety if they had to leave, okay? No, I'm asking the question, does it go beyond conditioning? Now, Singer doesn't require this, so I'm going beyond Singer's argument here. Singer just requires they can feel and are aware of pain, okay? And that's pretty easy to prove. However, many people believe that they're, they're more than that, that at least the higher level animals can and do feel emotions and have some depth to them and that it's not just conditioning that makes them do the things they do. Yeah, I think they do to some degree. Well, uh, I think we've all had experiences where we felt as though we weren't dealing with an automaton. That, you know, I mean, one of the reasons why people have pets is because they at least appear to be giving us some affection, right? Um, and, you know, there's always been this debate about, you know, what is it? Is it really just instinct and conditioning and training? Are they just trying to push our buttons so we'll feed them? Or do they really like being around us? And, and do they have those feelings? But um, definitely our experience would lead us to think that some are at least capable of more than just, just feeling pleasure and pain, but truly have some... Uh, you know, some sense of, of feelings beyond that, of, of happiness and sadness and so forth. Well, like I said, his argument doesn't rely on this, okay, but it's a further consideration and one that other people have raised um, that makes the argument maybe even stronger, um, at least as to respecting them if you don't want to accord them animal rights. Now, what he argues, however, is that, for instance, he gives examples. Uh, a dog or a cow is more sentient than an infant in his view. Okay? A full-grown dog or cow is more sentient than an infant when first born or even for the first week or two of life. But if we kill the infant, it's murder. But if we kill the cow or the dog, okay, if we kill the dog, we get into trouble. But look, we differentiate even among animals. We can kill the cow for food out of self-interest. Okay? And we don't have to give any justification other than that we want to eat the cow. Right? Well, he claims that this is discrimination and it's based on irrational prejudice. Okay? Even though even the fact that we distinguish among animals, you know, why do we distinguish between not everybody does, I guess, but distinguish between cats and dogs and cows in our culture. It's not acceptable to eat a cat or a dog, it's acceptable to eat a cow. Why? You know, why do you treat one like a pet and the other you, you don't? Okay. Um, so, in his view, we irrationally prefer human life, no matter how uh, degraded it is or how lacking in sentience it is, over the animal, uh, no matter how much you might say that animal has feelings, and that is just simply unjustifiable prejudice. Mm -hmm. I was just curious if you addressed um, like coma patients or people who can't feel pain. Yes, yes, they're in the same sort of category, even even more so. There's less question there. If a person is in an irreversible coma and who has no awareness and can feel no pain, then that person, you know, he doesn't see why we can't euthanize. But there, but physical pain isn't the only thing I suspect for him. But you know, that person is still capable of feeling pleasure with his life because he's aware 
of his life and what he's doing and, and he can still feel disappointment and so forth. So he's still experiencing life. Okay, The person in the coma isn't experiencing anything at all. And he would say, why can't we do, you know, end this person's life and, you know, unburden, you know, maybe the family or maybe society from this, okay? Why do we have this sort of irrational tendency to hang on to the person and wrangle about whether we ought to pull the plug and so forth and go through all these maneuvers um, when the person is, is, is not a human being anymore? in his view. Why do we do that? Again, he says it's, it, it's irrational. It doesn't make any sense. That's not a thinking, feeling, aware human being anymore. Okay? And yet people will spend lots of emotional energy, lots of uh, money, lots of time maintaining uh, that person. Okay? But they don't think anything of killing uh, an animal. Mm -hmm. Well, it really is a utilitarian argument because we experience it. Okay, because we experience it and it, it's what we as human beings and we presume animals also want to feel pleasure and to feel comfort and not pain, we're just going to accept that fact as that's what gives life value because that's what we experience. Okay, there's no, as a utilitarian, there doesn't need to be any sort of higher order justification. Okay, most human beings, almost all human beings, with the exception of this minority, can experience. Um, at times pleasure and pain and almost all of us desire pleasure and that's a good enough standard for him and he extends that standard to the animal kingdom he thinks it's obvious that they too um, desire pleasure and dislike pain that we can see evidence of that and that, that's good enough that establishes our ethical structure the sentient beings we should try to promote pleasure and we should try to avoid pain so it's very utilitarian. There's no um, you're trying to seek some sort of higher order or transcendent value there. I think, and, and a utilitarian just doesn't doesn't feel the need to do that. It's just good enough, okay? That that that's what we want, and that's what other creatures want. Um, okay. Uh, he talks about experimentation of animal on animals and raises this issue of sentience in, in this area too. <coughs> on uh, the right hand side of page 407 uh, towards the middle of that column he says if the experimenter is not prepared to use an orphaned human infant then his readiness to use non-humans is simple discrimination since adult apes, cats, mice and other mammals are more aware of what is happening to them, more self-directing and so far as we can tell at least as sensitive to pain as any human infant there seems to be no relevant characteristic that human infants possess that adult mammals do not have to the same or higher degree. Okay? So, um, he, you know, it's this type of thing that gets him into trouble. The mere suggestion that it might be okay to experiment on an um, orphan human infant um, because there's no difference between them and, the, uh, you know, the animal or maybe the animal is even less, is even more aware than the infant. Okay. Now he does this to push the envelope partly to show, you know, our irrationality again. But he does go on to argue, and this is the third part of the argument: the being's potential to develop should not be a criteria in evaluating their rights. Because remember, I said that. Um, that might be a potential argument to the contrary that the, the human infant, abandoned or not, you know, orphaned or not, he has the potential written in him to become a full uh, adult human being with a sentence, you know, and much more. And so we would choose the animal to do the experimenting on because the animal cannot advance past its present state of limited awareness but the human infant can you know go all the way and become a full-fledged um, human adult okay he argues against this distinction he says following along on that same area someone might try to argue that if it that what makes it wrong to experiment on a human infant is that the infant will in time and if left alone develop into more than the non-human 
but one would then, to be consistent, have to oppose abortion, since the fetus has the same potential as the infant. Indeed, even contraception and abstinence might be wrong on this account, since the egg and the sperm, considered jointly, also have the same potential. In any case, this argument gives still gives us no reason for selecting a non-human rather than a human with severe and irreversible brain damage as the subject of our experiments. Okay. So he goes from thinking about experimenting on a normal human infant to speculating on, okay, even if there is some problem with that and with you know the development of the human being, what rational reason would we have to not experiment on the severely... Um, brain damage thing. Okay. but uh, notice there that he uses the argument on uh, abortion and contraception and abstinence there as if to say those are our society's standards okay? and that, that again is characteristic of the utilitarian argument our society the majority of people in it um, still advocate or at least still accept abortion okay because it's still legal, therefore it reflects our society's wishes. Okay? For a utilitarian, the majority of society's wishes becomes the ethical standard. Okay? And so he's just basically saying there, look, we have said that abortion is okay, and we have an outlawed contraception. Okay? Um, so, you know, how can we say that, but say it's wrong to do this? Again, he's using that type of argument. You have agreed that human life is not valuable inside the womb. How can you then say again that it's valuable once it's outside the womb under certain circumstances? Okay. All right. So, um, those are the three parts of Singer's arguments that he uses to develop um, his animal rights philosophy okay and he concludes that because animals are sentient then they too can enjoy the good life in their own way okay in their own capacity and they should and that this is only justice okay if we are to be consistent as a society this is justice well what changes in our behavior would have to take place towards animals in order to satisfy Singer's view of animal rights what would we have to do differently? Uh huh. All become vegetarians, I suppose. Well, yeah, definitely we'd have to all become vegetarians. Not keep them in captivity. Mm hmm. Okay, so we'd adopt vegetarianism. And no captivity, so you couldn't. You wouldn't be able to have pets, would you? Or would you? I don't think no. What's that? No zoos. Definitely no zoos. Unless you get attached to the symbiotic relationship. Yeah, that's that's the question. Are they happier with you? Justify that because those animals. Mhm. Mm yeah. So maybe we would have to back off on this a little bit because it's clear that many of them are happier with us than without us, as long as we treat them well, right? And if happiness is the goal then you wouldn't want to throw all the cats and dogs of the world out, right? Because they wouldn't be too happy. But I think you could definitely say no zoos because zoos are just, you know, we have animals on display for people to look at, but they don't have that human bond. Not not usually anyway. Yeah, there's a there's a trend in zoos to um, to to try to not do that, to try to treat animals more like they're just in their natural habitat and and uh, that reflects that different philosophy, you know, the, that maybe they're happier without people. But I certainly have witnessed what you have at, at our own Sunset Zoo, the animal keepers there develop relationships with these animals. You'd have to do whatever you could to help them survive, including keeping them in captivity if necessary in order to help that process, wouldn't you? And there'd be lots of other things you'd have to do, like making sure the habitats that they live in are not destroyed or disrupted. Mm -hmm. I have a question kind of not related to this. Does Singer have any problem or does he address the fact that animals don't afford each other any of these rights? I mean, <laughs> <coughs> you know, a wolf or a predator will eat another animal without thinking of its you know, rights to live and mm -hmm. you, know, you can't turn on 
Yes. There's yes. rational, sentient beings that should, or they're, they're rational, sentient beings that should be cognizant of others. So we're gonna, what is, yeah, yeah. That that's a good objection, and it's it's one that we can talk more about. But I guess to answer your question, does Singer have any response? I think that's where he he does get into maybe a little bit of trouble because he's he's going to say human beings are are more rational. We're thinking beings. We can see the implications of things. In one sense, we're just like the animals. In the other sense, we're not like. Animals. In in another sense, we're caretakers of them because of our because of our natural superiority, right? He's not saying we should all live like animals. He's saying animals should live more like human beings, which is like itself a sort of, in effect, could be argued to be a prejudice for our particular... Yeah, yeah, very good, right. And the morality comes from the fact that we're beings who can think and who have much more depth and who can project um, consequences and so forth. That's why we're moral beings, and that makes us very different from animals. And so you're sort of back to this stewardship idea, you know, on a, on a greater level, that human beings have a special responsibility to animals, okay? Um, okay, well, we have to stop experimenting on them too, right? Definitely, he takes that on right, right away, so we know where, he, where he's coming from on that issue. Um, and perhaps we have to stop using them for work as well. Okay, I don't know. Again, that you know, the argument that you raised about what they're more comfortable with would a, would a uh, you know a shepherd dog, uh, whatever they're called, uh, you know, the kind that shepherd sheep. They've been doing that for generations and generations and generations. Would they be happier if suddenly they were out of a job? You know, I don't know. Well, if you're talking about evaluating the good that we get from eating them versus the the pain that they experience from their treatment. He would say, you know, we don't need to eat meat. You know, that's the thing is if we needed it absolutely for survival, that might be a different issue, but we can survive without meat. Therefore, it's not a necessity, so the trade-off is far from equal. Okay? Um, and I think that he also projects some of his own assumptions on animals. You know, I think that's obvious that, that he doesn't know exactly what they feel. Nobody can know that, but he's assuming some things about how they feel on the basis of how they behave. Yeah. yeah. Something to add? Okay. I I'm wondering what you think that we should do about carnivorous animals because you know there's like all this genocide going on where uh-huh. animals kill, are killing other animals off. You know, so should we step in and, and try and stop that, or you know, how how do we handle it? Well, that that's I guess you know I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the problems related to that, and that's certainly an objection that what we have is we have a food chain that's established in the world. And uh, there, are, there are creatures at the top of that food chain in every habitat or in every environment, and they're the, the you know the the predators like the lions on the savanna or whatever. And uh, human beings, if you study their evolution, or at least what scientists say that uh, we've we've evolved from, one uh, fairly established theory is that we evolved into the beings we are because we're carnivores. Because our brain, our brain uh, could not have developed to the size and complexity that it is without a lot of protein, and so we wouldn't be what we are today if we hadn't have been carnivores for millions of years, according to that theory. Mm-hmm. Now that is a problem: overpopulation, which we experience sometimes uh, very directly with with deer, for instance, where. Um, you know, there have been almost crises in some states with deer overpopulation, and they've had to bat- open up hunting because without that hunting, the deer would overpopulate to the point where they would starve, and they start to starve, you know. Um, and we're one of their natural predators. Um, so I think that the ban- you could argue that the balance of nature would be disrupted if people stopped. Now, it wouldn't be the case for, dem- for animals such as cows and chickens, necessarily, because you could certainly s- simply stop overproducing them. I mean, it's us that produces the quantity of these animals. But in nature, uh, there are certain animals that would overpopulate without, without us. And, um, though he doesn't suggest it, if we did stop animals from killing each other, which I'm not sure how we would do that, we would then have a huge problem of overpopulation and discombobulation of the natural um, order of things. I mean, that's. But he doesn't propose that. Okay. 
again, you know, that there's a different standard for human behavior than for animal behavior. Okay? But those are a couple of arguments. Um, another argument based on um, evolution also would be that every species has um, always wished to preserve itself. Okay? And, um, you know, that human beings are no exception. If you see human beings as a part of that, of the evolutionary process, it makes sense not only for human beings to take food if they need it and if that will enhance their health somehow, but it also makes sense for human beings to protect even the weakest among them. And you could say that that was a natural instinct to, say, protect the helpless infant or the handicapped person even, severely handicapped, just out of the instinct that this is another human being, this is a member of my species. And all species, or at least most, do things to protect uh, themselves as a species, including usually, but not always, the protection of their young. Right, you know, even when they're very, very tiny and could be eaten. Okay? There are some exceptions to that rule, right? But that's usually when there's so many babies produced that without them eating them, there would be overpopulation. Okay? But if you're that type of person who likes the, you know, the natural selection argument or the argument of evolution, surely you could simply say that human beings are no different from animals in that they're acting on instinct. And therefore it would be a violation of their natural instinct to start to destroy any of their own kind. Okay? Now that's somewhat delayed by abortion. Okay? But, uh, but then again, perhaps not if we have managed to distinguish, at least in our minds, uh, between infants and and fetuses. Okay. But there are those folks who raise that, that complaint against abortion that it's basically unnatural for human beings to intentionally kill their their own kind. Okay. So there are those arguments. There's also also obviously religiously based arguments and we've already talked about them too. Right. Is there anything else that uh, anybody else would like to bring up that might be an argument against Singer and his animal rights ideas? Yes. Um, yeah, my sense from reading a little, I haven't read this whole book, but just from reading a little bit about his argument is that this is sort of what would be a, perhaps most socially acceptable. In other words, there's no like magic cutoff point for him, obviously, because he can also talk about you know elderly people um, at the same time. But that might be a point beyond which we really would not feel we wanted to go. And so he sort of arbitrarily selects that. You know, in other words, in the first month of life, okay, and we've all experienced what an infant is like in the first month of life and how they don't appear to be, they're, you know, not very aware at all and so forth. And so that might be the only reason he selects that cutoff point. It's not like suddenly they become immediately much more sentient after 28 days. Okay. But it's that, it's that uh, suggestion which has gotten him into a lot of trouble. And like I said, he, he makes suggestions for the purposes, partly for the purposes of, of getting us to think about our own lack of comprehension as to why we prefer some things and not others and so forth. As far as why these policies like this might benefit people, um, I think that Singer believes that if that we spend a lot of time, money, and effort supporting life that is um, that is not very valuable at all, that could be better spent on life that that is. Okay, um, and that's a tough argument. That's a tough ethical argument to make in the Western world, and particularly in America, where. Um, individualism is so so very important to us. It really we feel like it really shouldn't matter, you know, if we have to spend several million dollars on maintaining somebody's life, even if even if it is at a very low level. You know, we we just we we find it more difficult to go there. I suspect that his way of thinking would be much easier um, to to take and is reflected actually in um, the People's Republic of China. For instance, you know where um, you know the state advocates and actually uh, has enforced abortions past one child. Okay, and I'm sure 
does not spend nearly as much money on keeping people alive as we do. Okay. Um, are there any other questions or, or comments before we go? I planned on getting to Earth first today, but I can get to it tomorrow and then we'll talk about uh, uh, women's rights and, and gay rights too. Okay? Uh, we'll see you Thursday.